So imagine we're in the year 1796 and there's a virus going around the world which is making a lot of casualties. Sound familiar? Well, back in that day, there was a revolutionary doctor who had the idea of doing something radical. Namely, injecting a 13-year-old boy with a virus. That physician's name was Edward Jenner. And he actually based his hypothesis on the observation that English milkmaids were not getting sick from smallpox. So here's what he thought. Maybe because of the cowpox virus, those milkmaids were immune to the smallpox virus. And he proved his idea by injecting that 13 year old boy with living cowpox virus only to find out that the boy became resistant to smallpox. And that's the birth of vaccination. Now why am I telling you this? Well, I had this question if one could study vaccinology as a field on its own. And the answer is yes. However, probably not every university gives it as a course on its own or as a major on its own. In my day, for example, immunology and infection was my major and I had a course on vaccinology. So the other way around, if you would have a major that is called vaccinology, it would probably also incorporate courses like immunology, bacteriology, virology, and other related courses, maybe epidemiology. The point where I'm getting at is that vaccinology is multidisciplinary. Let me clarify further. Let me ask you, how would you make a vaccine or design a vaccine if you don't know anything about the structure of viruses or the structure of bacteria and different classes of bacteria and viruses? How would you do that if you don't know anything about the immune system? how it responds, how you have innate immunity and adaptive immunity. So the good thing about this is that all these courses can like be integrated. All your knowledge about the immune system and about pathogens can be integrated into the design of a vaccine. And it's very complex. First and foremost, because there's multiple ways of designing a vaccine. There's multiple vaccine types. You can have vaccines where the bacterium is still alive, but it's attenuated so that it loses its virulence. It cannot infect you further. It cannot make you sick. Another example would be where you like synthetically make a mimic of the pathogen. For instance, with virus-like particles. That's particles that mimic the outer capsule of a virus, but it lacks the genomic data. It lacks the RNA or DNA so that the virus cannot well, it's actually not a virus, it's a virus-like particle, so it cannot further infect your cells. The fact that you do not get sick might also pose a problem for the efficacy of the vaccine. Because if you do get sick, if pathogens are in your bloodstream or in your cells and they're multiplying, they have a big viral or pathogenic load, which triggers your immune system. So if you keep that viral mass, that critical mass, the viral, the critical load, if you keep that low, in terms of a vaccine, then you should probably have something that will boost your immune system along with it. And that's called adjuvants. Adjuvants can all come in different types. And one of those, for instance, would be the addition of mercury to certain vaccines to boost the immune response. And that's where a lot of controversy was and still is going around. Remember the link with autism and the anti-vaxxer movement? So there were studies going around that claimed that there would be a link between autism and the mercury in vaccines. So if there's mercury in a vaccine that you get when you are a child, that you would develop autism later on. Well, eventually these studies were deemed false, false claims. There's no causal link between the mercury in vaccines, which is in tiny, tiny bits just to, enough to boost your immune system to trigger that immune response to those non-virulent pathogens that are in the vaccine. But of course, related to that is the caution that every vaccine developer should take, every pharmaceutical company in developing their vaccine. It should be rigorously tested. But nowadays, the coronavirus is doing a lot of damage to our society. And we're kind of hoping that we can accelerate this without any casualties. So there's multiple companies developing these vaccines. My friend Life Labler has a video series on the coronavirus, also covering the vaccine development. So very welcome to check that out. So what I'm saying is that I hope that there won't be too many adverse events 
in clinical trials and that patients will be safe and that the vaccine development for the coronavirus will be successful, will be safe and will be efficacious to make our society normal again. So the reason I'm making this video right now is that someone first of all asked me this question on the channel and second of all because I think a lot of young people will become interested in fighting future coronavirus like epidemics by studying vaccinology or becoming virologists or something in the field of immunology where their skills could be relevant in preventing future outbreaks like this. So in essence, yes, you can study vaccinology. It is a field on its own. It is a course on its own. Usually it's embedded with molecular bacteriology, molecular virology, parasitology, immunology, everything related with the immune system and infectious diseases. So I hope this video reassured you a bit in terms of what to choose for your future direction of study. And I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.